afternoon, everyone. Welcome to OSHA at Dartmouth's first special event of 2022. My name is Pam Allen, and I am OSHA's special events coordinator. Throughout the year, we hope to offer a variety of both virtual and live events. <clears throat> Stay tuned for future lectures, literary readings, book discussions, and other one-time events. This afternoon, we're very proud to present Frank Gatto and his lecture, The Battle Between the College and the University. Frank was due to present this lecture pre-pandemic over two years ago, and then the pandemic hit. Then Frank was to have a high flex lecture this afternoon with a live audience until Omicron again shut our doors. Frank is new to virtual events, and we're very glad that he's agreed to present this webinar. OSHA President Steve Toffel will introduce Frank and facilitate the conversation. Steve has a very special relationship with Frank, who was his faculty advisor many years ago. Steve asks that you please type questions in the Q&A for all to see. Please enjoy our program. My name is Steve Toffel. I'm the president of OSHA at Dartmouth. <laughs> and we're learning to work with our new technology. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing somebody that I met about a half a century ago at Union College. Uh, Frank is the chairman of the Department of English Literature. Uh, he is a long time, uh, has, has had a long time interest in the distinction between the college and the university. He's given it quite a bit of thought and he has a, quite a bit of experience. He's also a uh, uh, alumni of Dartmouth, um, he, uh, class of 57, Eight. 58, 58 on the he's a youngster. He's a, he's a youngster. So anyway, it is my pleasure to turn this over to Frank and uh, Frank Dotto. Okay, thank you. When you knew me, I was pronounced Gato, but that was a problem <laughs> of identity. My daughter said to me, you know, you're, you're a hypocrite, Dad. And I said, God, one thing I don't want to be accused of is being a hypocrite. I, I, you know, I've, I've abhorred hip hypocrisy all my life. And she said, well, you always correct the pronunciation of your Italian-American students when you call off the roll for the first time this semester. And here you're saying Gato instead of Gatto. And I recognize that, yes, indeed, my father had capitulated when he immigrated. And uh, it was time that I set things straight. Of course, too many people at that time knew me as Gato. So I waited until I quit my job <laughs> at Union, I'm a terminal disgust. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and I came back to this area, which always felt like home for some strange reason. Um, <clears throat> and I decided that was the time when I would uh, correct my pronunciation. So, but I go by either name, but I've never been called anywhere in the world, uh, Gadu, which I encountered in New Hampshire and Vermont for the first time. Well, I didn't try this up. Just call me Frank. And uh, I, I don't like titles, very un-American in that. Uh, uh, I'm a lowercase d, and since the Trump administration has become an uppercase d Democrat. Uh, I didn't know quite how to start this lecture. And it's, unfortunately, at least I, I look back on my career, those things that I am most passionate about, I tend to mess up in my lectures. Uh, and I, I, my passion has been Melville and Faulkner, but, and I've taught those authors again and again, and I'm always dissatisfied with the job I've done. So prepare yourselves. I will be, I'm sure, dissatisfied with what I've done, what I will have done today, but I'll give it a try. Uh, I asked Steve how he would advise me to start off. Should I go into the history of liberal arts education? Should we go into antiquity? I could do that. Should we talk about the enlightenment coming out of this so-called medieval period? What we focused on? Should I look at the anthropological need for some buffer between adolescence or at least childhood and adulthood? And he said, why don't you just start off by saying why you are there? Well, okay, that's not a bad place. I'm here because my grandparents, all four of them, entered adulthood illiterate in Italy. Hmm. My 
maternal <coughs> grandparents taught themselves as adults to read and write. Uh, my grandmother, because uh, her children were going to America and she wanted to be able to communicate with them. My grandfather, however, was more the scholar, the meditative type. He became, after he had taught himself to read, quite the scholar of history and political philosophy. In fact, when I went over to see him in 1956 for the first time, I was astounded by the breadth of his discourse, his knowledge of political philosophy that would have put the two Dartmouth classmates I was trans uh, 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 traveling with truly to shame, and me too, perhaps. Anyway, uh, so I come from a background that has always put stress on education. My parents did not get past elementary school. My mother didn't because she was a woman. It wasn't worth educating a woman. Her native language was Piedmontese, not Italian. She was mocked in school for that, but a very intelligent woman. My father had to earn a living because his, his father was an alcoholic and could not support the family. So he didn't get very far. But there was always, I was always told that I was going to college. My parents had no idea what college was. Maybe I didn't either. But I've really studied this system. I've lived it as um, I've lived it as a high school student, or I even go back to grammar school when I was scolded when I, they handed out the Dick and Jane book, and I read it all that night, and I was told I shouldn't do that. <laughs> and then they gave me the Alice and Jerry book, and I read that all in one night, and they said, "No, you shouldn't do that." <laughs> and I found that over and over again, the educational system was trying to put a break on me so I would fit in with everybody else instead of encouraging exploration. And that was really a, a kind of basic approach to what we do in our educational system. We try to make people docile. We try to make them learn how to follow society's orders instead of putting the stress upon the development of the mind. I found this was true in college for all the talk that I heard about the liberating arts uh, and the value of education, that the, that the practices that I was encountering in the classroom, how the whole thing was structured was not really geared toward education, toward, toward the opening of my mind to ideas. Uh, it was to the process of getting a degree. I was told over and over again, a degree doesn't, as long as you get a degree, it doesn't matter what you're getting a degree in. Well, I think it does matter. And I think it does matter how we look upon education at the college level. Uh, I, I thought I was going to be a lawyer when I was an undergraduate. Then I got to law school and um, I discovered that this was not for me. We were greeted uh, first day by Dean Griswold. We were told, uh, was, I think it was his first sentence, leave your ideas of justice at the door. That is not what the study of law is about. Well, what the hell was I doing there then? <laughs> and, and one of my professors had told me that I was a born teacher. And that started rattling around in my head. And so I, I withdrew from law school and uh, I went down to Duke and got my PhD there. Uh, I, I found it, that, that there too, it was a matter, of, it was a matter of, of not really developing the way I looked upon literature and how what I was teaching in the classroom really related to my purposes in that classroom. It's all geared towards getting the grades in and what the grades uh, qualified one for and, and that sort of thing. And my colleagues too uh, were not really interested in the kinds of questions that I wish to explore. And I wish that they would explore with me. In fact, when I raised questions, I was looked at upon as an obstructionist. Um, well, more of that, I don't want to get too autobiographical about all that. So I went through graduate school and I spent um, I spent uh, 33 years on the faculty at Union College. Uh, it was, I deliberately wanted to be a college teacher, not a university teacher. University of Virginia was interested in me and so was the University of British Columbia. But I wanted, 
I really wanted to focus on college education. And I saw then a truly a distinction between the two. That takes me back now to where one of the places that I thought I might start with, which is the history. I won't go into the entire uh, presentation. Obviously that would take uh, you know, more than time than you have and I have. But what is this curious thing in America called the college? We go back to, to 1636, the founding of Harvard College, right? That's an interesting thing. This was before it was Harvard. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was getting concerned. I remember these people had come over in 1620. They're 17 years later, and they're starting to worry about the fact that the ministers who are the leaders of this community, there's no real distinction between the church and the state at this point, the leaders are dying. The people who were educated in, in England are dying, getting old. And who is coming up? A group of people who are increasingly ignorant, not about theology, that was not the focus of the, um, uh, of the court, as it was called, but ignorant about the world. The world is changing, starting, changing very rapidly. They're aware of this. And the feeling is that to be a good minister, that is to be a good leader of the community. This, this person needs to be more aware intellectually of the intellectual currents of, of this world. So on the one hand, the founding of Harvard, which acquires its name two years later through John uh, Howard, uh, John Harvard, who gives this this new idea, this university, or this, I'm sorry, this college, um, twice as much money as the Massachusetts Bay Colony had allocated. The colony had allocated 408 uh, uh, pounds uh, for this uh, project. And he gave it uh, you know, twice as much, 700 and, and, and something pounds. More important, he gave, it a, gave this new institution his library. And he seems to have been a man, we don't know that much about Harvard, the man, but we do know that he was interested in breadth. Uh, and so the college, the idea of the college from its very beginning recognizes that it has an obligation to the community, but it also has an obligation to the individual, to the cultivation of the individual as a leader who's able to communicate about and through uh, so many things that are going on around him in the greater world, beyond the confines of this, this uh, small settlement in the new world. Uh, I'm College of William Mary is down south, but founded for different reasons. In, in many ways, the history of the college is one of, of what happens in the Northeast. <coughs> Harvard gives birth to Yale. Why do they think that, uh, that they need a new college? Ah, because Harvard is getting too liberal. Uh, it is not orthodox enough. And so Yale, oddly enough, given its subsequent history, uh, becomes a place for correction of these wild people, you know, uh, at Harvard. So this college idea starts to spread, but it's not really until until the, uh, the, the, the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, that it really starts acquiring its most distinctive uh, characteristics. That you can, we can think of the 19th century as the time when um, not only is the idea of the college gestating, but it's really born. And then it's becomes something else. It becomes the seedbed for this new creature, not new in the world, but new here called the university. Uh, one of the things that happens during this late period of the, of the uh, uh, 18th century is that Americans who want more education tend to go to Germany, which is looked upon as the leading country for, for uh, uh, intellect of all sorts. And, and a good many of them, a disproportionate number of them, go to the University of Göttingen, which was founded in 1730 something. 
specifically in order to promote the ideas of the enlightenment, right? It's going to promote the ideas of the enlightenment to know more about the world through science, but also through the humanities. You know, the, it's the air of, of what has been happening since uh, the Renaissance. And so those ideas, which are university ideas of Göttingen, uh, are transferred and slowly start to grow uh, in the collegiate system in, uh, in, uh, in the United States. The South tended to send its bright young men to England. A good many of the people who worked on the Constitution, uh, on the movement for independence, had known each other in Europe. Uh, they spoke the same language in many ways. They had read the same books. Uh, they, they had studied Greek because that was looked upon as an important language, but they sort of had problems a bit with Greek. They were more at home in Latin. One of the real founding founders in terms of the world of ideas that becomes the womb for, you know, notions of the American community is Virgil. What is the motto of the United States? A pluribus unum. Um, we can't prove this. We don't know, as far as I know, nobody wrote it down. But the assumption is this comes from the Georgics. Oddly enough, at this moment in our history, it originally refers to, in the Georgics, refers to the making of pesto. From many <laughs> colors, one. <laughs> they weren't thinking about black and white in those days, but they were thinking about creating a people, a nation, a tribe. And they looked upon it as important that we shared, at least those who led our communities, that we shared the same background, the same approach to things intellectually, the, the, the same process of reasoning. And that this was promoted by a common core of understanding mo mostly of, of the ancients, not increasingly so. The 19th century, what's happening in the 19th century? Early on in that part of the world, the Northeast, technology is taking, taking hold. Society is becoming more dependent upon mechanics and machines. And there's a feeling that, well, maybe we need to look at that part of our civic life more closely prepare our rising generation for their roles in this different kind of economy. So this starts this, you know, in the first, first decades of the 19th century. In about the, the 1830s, there's even a, the, the thought starts to germinate that we need to have colleges that are devoted to agriculture, so we can learn to do soup farming, not on the basis of what you learn from the farmer down the road, but in terms of people who've really studied how to get the most out of the land and how to, how to conduct this, this economic, or, or crucial economic activity. But also this new thing called mechanics. Um, if I can find it here in my uh, arrangement of notes. I'd like to read to you from the actual act. Um, uh, where was it? Damn it. Uh, I can't find it. Um, from, anyway, well, I'll refer to it from memory. From the actual act that is passed in, well, it's drawn up and fails in the Congress in the 1850s. Um, but then they, the people who are mostly in favor of this, who come from the Western states, understand that they need a prominent and respected Eastern legislator to back it. And who serves in that role? Justin Morrill. He's eager to be their leader in this regard. And so we have the creation of the land grant college passed. Um, what year? 1860. The nation is at war. This is the time of the Civil War, when the Civil War is just flaring out. But it's looked upon as a, a, a major concern for the future to create this new kind of institution. 
And it starts off, it's rather interesting. It starts on this, this you can see the politics in, the, in the, the wording. It starts off by saying, we are not excluding, you know, we are not excluding the study of the classics and the humanities. Mm -hmm. And that's to, that's to, to blunt the criticism of those who had had that kind of training and say, hey, listen, you're not, you're not having any exposure to those ideas and those thinkers who helped form us as a nation, as a new kind of tribe, as it were, which is what the word nation originally refers to. There's a lot of concern about this. And with a, with a, maybe we're the only nation, first nation, um, in which we look to our writers to tell us who we are. That's an important point that, may, that we should be a, accentuating more in our study of American literature and you know, uh, in our history, uh, basically. Um, so we're not going to exclude this and we're not going to exclude military training, which is also important for our future defense, you know, interestingly enough, because there had, it had failed, this bill had failed in the Congress and the Senate uh, earlier precisely because it had not provided for military. So we're tossing these bones out in, at the beginning. Yes, the humanities, yes, to including, we're not forgetting about you people who are concerned about military training, but the focus is going to be on agriculture and mechanics. How are we going to finance this? Uh, in my naivete, when I first heard about land grant colleges, I just assumed the federal government had some land <laughs> in these various states, and it says, okay, we're gonna give you this land. Much more complicated than that. They took the, every land grant college got 30,000 acres of federal land, but not necessarily, let's say in the state of New York or the state of Massachusetts. They got 30,000 acres of land just somewhere in the United States, in the territories of the United States. It had to be contiguous. And also it had to be profitable. This was the basis of their endowments. And of course, the interesting thing is that where do they get this land from? They took it from the Indians. In some cases, land that we had by treaty given to the Indians all over again, but we didn't seem to wonder or worry about that uh, at all. Um, Cornell, which was a designated land grant college in New York, um, made quite a good thing if they had 30,000 acres in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, but it was good timberland. Uh, and uh, it provided very handsomely for them. Anyway, so now you have growing, or at least in some sort of competition, the traditional concept of the college and what will soon become much more a university because of the accent on practical subjects, agriculture and mechanics, technology specifically. Okay. Whereas the colleges are still emphasizing the study of Latin and Greek, study of the Bible, the study of our moral thinkers, the colleges tend to have a fixed curriculum. They have a notion more or less of what they're in existence for. Whereas the university is there to meet whatever political desires or desires expressed politically for livelihoods, for, for um, improving the economy, for advancing us on the world stage uh, uh, and this new world that, uh, that we are creating uh, in the course of the 19th century. Some interesting things happen in this, the course of this development um, you know, towards, the, towards the end of the century, as I would mention. One of them, it may not seem all that important to you initially, um, is the role of sports. Harvard, always being the leader, decides because it has a lot of people who want to see this new game, not that new, but that are interested in this new game, called football. I uh, don't remember if they're throwing the ball at this point yet, but they, you know, 
rush at each other and <clears throat> try to advance it. Anyway, a lot of alumni interest in this around the Boston area. So they decide, let's capitalize on this. We build Harvard Stadium. <laughs> Everybody's astounded at this huge building that they've created. Are they ever going to be able to fix it or fill it? <laughs> they did. It was so successful that who follows with a competing building? Yale, of course. And that's how the Yale Bowl was created. Meanwhile, University of Michigan is looking at this and saying, hey, this is kind of interesting, you know? Let's give people a reason to be proud of their state, to give the kind of a boost to interest in our school, our university, by promoting loyalty, not just on the part of alumni, but people in the state, which has political ramifications, uh, to football. And so they create a huge monster, which is the, uh, the, uh, the stadium uh, out in Ann Arbor. You know, they dig out a swamp, they, they, all kinds of new technology is employed that they don't even know it's going to work. And finally, the gamble does work. And they have this huge facility, and the the interest in football grows and grows. Now, why is that important? Because it makes the university, state universities for the most part, uh, subject to the enthusiasm of its alumni. It enters into the political process. Um, not, I don't. I haven't checked this in the last couple of years, but the last, I think, three or four years ago, when I last checked, every state in the union, except for one, and I'm not a Vermonter, although I live in Vermont, uh, I'm proud to say that Vermont is the single exception, in which the highest paid employee, that is person <laughs> paid, <laughs> you're nodding, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. <laughs> The highest, huh? He's a the, yeah, the highest paid employee in that state was a coach of a major sport. Uh, you know, 49 out of 50 states. And that continues. And you think that the colleges are going to stand it by. No, no, they're alumni. They're, they're crazy about sports too. What's the most important question that they want to address as alumni? Are we going to have a winning basketball team, a winning football team? Uh, uh, one of the trustees who was a good friend of mine way back, oh, when was it? Maybe it took, this was back at the end of the uh, 20th century. So that one, he, and he was a petition candidate, which was looked upon as you know, not quite playing by the rules, although that was part of the rules, uh, said that he advised the president at that time, the most important thing you have to do as president and he told me this himself, the most important thing you have to do with president is to make sure the alumni are happy by having a winning football team. Mm -hmm. you know? That's shocking. It's shocking, but it's also part of this process by which the concept of the college or the university is being shaped by pleasing a body outside mm -hmm. of it and to do so through non-curricular, non-intellectual pursuits and goals. And we're in that fix right now. I got to do with uh, Steve and I, you know, I love to talk to this guy. Um, we met yesterday and just started talking generally uh, about what we cover today. Uh, we always go off track. And he said to me, or he asked me, who is the leading educator in America today? I said, I can't think of one. I can't think of one, why? Because the people who are leading our colleges and universities are not people who are particularly well-educated. I mean, they're educated for the most, they're successful in, in one way or another, but they have not attained their offices because of their ideas about education. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. We have a system of higher education now, which, and I said this to Steve yesterday, I asked him if he knew who Topsy was. 
and it didn't ring a bell with him. And this was a long, long time ago in my reading history. But she's a character, correct me if I'm wrong, she's a character in Uncle Tom's Cabin. And somebody asked her at one point, when were you born? And Topsy's answer is that she was not born, she just growed. <laughs> and that's pretty much what our system of higher education is like. It's just growth. There's not been a point at which we've examined from the very basic purposes of this activity, what we want this institution or this group of institutions uh, to, uh, to, uh, to accomplish. And uh, <clears throat> let's see, what do they want? There's something else I want to, oh yes. Uh, in terms of what is happening to education generally in the 19th century and early 20th century, perhaps there's no more important figure than President Charles Eliot of Harvard. He is the one who really creates Harvard University, the transformation of Harvard College into a university. And of course, what Harvard does has tremendous effect on the rest of, of the competitors in this field. He introduces the elective system. Now that's important, that's a departure from the notion that, well, here we have this body of information, not which and body of things to think about, um, not which is, uh, which is the be all and end all, you know, that this is all you need in order to be a good citizen and, uh, and have a, a, a reasonably active mental life. But this is, is one way of getting at it, this package that we're not going to focus on that saying, come to us, we'll give you this basic education. To say, no, come to us, you're the customer, and we'll try to accommodate what you're interested in. And so we see the curriculum start to spread out, to serve customers, to serve a demand. <laughs> I've been, I've been invited, uh, I've been involved in lots of fights at Union College here at Dartmouth, I'm all looked upon as an outsider um, uh, about, this, uh, uh, about this matter. And um, I've said to people over and over again, that what's happened to these institutions is that they've become souks or bazaars, that everybody sets up his own little stand or his little shop. And it, there's nothing that unifies the souk or the bazaar, um, except the fact that customers come to it. And one shop is selling this kind of ornament, another shop is selling food and so forth and so forth. As long as there's a demand, then we can go after that group of people who demand this sort of thing and make money from it by awarding a degree. The most part, you know, our higher education system sells degrees. It's more concerned with selling degrees than looking at what constitutes the kind of education it is seeking to promote. And uh, this is not just a, you know, a, you know, captious jive that I'm, I mean, I've seen this in operation in my own life over and over again. I was told, don't pick a subject for your dissertation that's going to take you too long. You've got to get your degree. <laughs> your dissertation, I remember starting off uh, working on a subject, and then somebody, uh, the doctorate is, was supposed to be an addition to knowledge, something new, that you weren't just reviewing what had been written before. And I took that seriously. And uh, I had a an idea. I had read John Dos Passos, and I said, no, we, we have the wrong idea about John Dos Passos. This was part of a, a much greater, much broader uh, interest I had in the nature, the mainstreams of American literature. You know, what is, what is it always at the center? What are we constantly going back to? So I wanted to do John Dos Passos, and somebody came out with a book, which essentially took my basic idea, so I thought there wasn't any point in doing that. So I talked to my advisor. He said, well, don't worry about it. Stick, stick with what you're doing. You can just sort of tweak this. And I said, no, 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 no. I want to, I want to cut new ground. He said, well, that's dangerous. It's going to take you too much, too much time. So I decided I would 
because I was interested in the expatriate movement in the death of the First World War. And I did my dissertation on a woman, Kay Boyle, which men didn't do in those days. You didn't write about women. <laughs> um, and then later on, I was hit by the feminists who said, how dare you teach about a woman? You're not a woman, you know? <laughs> um, and I said, well, what did I omit in my dissertation that you think is so essential? And this woman who was criticizing me said, you know, named them off. And I said, no, I did that. I did that. I did that. And I did that. Well, it still didn't matter. I was still wrong, which customary. Anyway, we need to re-examine things. Uh, and one of the points I'd like to emphasize is that in this competition of approaches to education, that what has happened is that the university has become the font out of which the college has spelled out its purposes, has, uh, has uh, executed its operations. And it's done this in a number of ways. For one thing, in order to prove that the college is serious, uh, they want to brag that they have as many doctorates uh, as the state universities, which are more and more dependent you know, in their assessments is what have you published lately? So that you have people who are as scholars, that's in quotation marks, as scholars, they have, instead of growing in their profession by broadening their understanding of reading more, the immediate goal is to get your damn degree as quickly as you can. So you then get your you know, you're on tenure track and after six years, you'll be examined in terms of how many articles you have, you have published. And it's more important to have published a number of articles and books um, than it is to have a broad, have a broader and broader base. And I've seen that come up over and over again. I was on, uh, on a tenure, <clears throat> uh, a senior committee for the salaries, promotions, and tenure uh, oversight of what was going on a faculty committee. I remember uh, somebody had come up for tenure and he had not published very much. And that didn't bother me, but the nature of what he had published, I thought was rather infantile. And uh, I uh, read his piece, which I thought was perhaps, perhaps worth publishing in the Scholastic magazine, but it was certainly not a reflection of the kind of approach to a problem of an analysis that I thought suitable for dissertation. I stated this openly and I was immediately condemned. I had no right, I was told, because I did not, I was not a member of that discipline. And I said, no, but I know how to read. I know how to evaluate an argument. Now, I'm interested in what this fellow has to accomplish intellectually. Uh, of course, I was voted down. I had no animus against the guy, but uh, the point is to, you know, con uh, continue the fellow's <laughs> career. And after you were in college for six years, usually you have developed another political base, so you have friends who see their futures tied to your advancement, and, and it, it, it's not material that is looked upon, you know, sufficiently. Okay, the university starts to call the shots to set the standards on what, what a, a teacher should be. More and more that emphasis on research. Now listen, I am not against research. I am not against continuing to grow and to learn as a teacher. I think that is a prime thing to do if you're going to be a, a good teacher. You've got to be a model for your students as to what a life of the mind is about. Too many teachers, too many, have their little, uh, first of all, immediately after they get their jobs, they want to develop their courses so they can publish. Them, so that whatever preparation they do for their courses is in some way tied to what can be published. So the <coughs> nature of the curriculum keeps shrinking uh, in terms of specialties rather than in the college level, rather than in terms of this much broader uh, uh, approach to things. Uh, so that's dangerous uh, in eroding that notion of what a college should be. 
the university is calling the shots because of most of its college presidents come from universities and have been trained in universities. Who becomes a college president? More and more these days is someone who's never even sat in a classroom. But even those who have sat in classrooms, I've seen in, my, in the course of my years in the profession, tend to be those people who at a certain age, maybe around late 30s, early 40s, discover that they don't really like to teach at all and are not very successful at it and are not really scholars. I remember uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, there was a man who uh, was very popular in the classroom. He was very, uh, he was one of the guys. And he was very well liked. And it was thought that, well, maybe we should make this fellow a dean of students, the dean of students. And so he talked it over with his wife. And she said, oh, you don't really want to publish anything. You know, you're, not, you're not concerned with the nature of what's going on in the 18th century in Great Britain. And you don't really, you like being with, with students, but you don't like lecturing. You don't like those classes. So take the job. And indeed, he became dean of students, and then he became president of one college, and then he became president of another college. So his orientation in terms of his himself and his own career, and we all tend to replicate ourselves. You know, we all do. We, we want to see the future in our terms. We have children hoping that our children will at least share some of our values and, and will carry forward, not just in terms of our DNA, but in terms of who we are. We try not to, and we shouldn't, try to force them to go against their inclinations. But we at least say, well, okay, this is how I can help. This is how I can extend my influence beyond my lifetime. So I think it's an inborn uh, trait and desire. Uh, and, and, and so it is with colleges and universities. And I think you need people at the top who, who are themselves intellectuals who are themselves involved in what this school is supposed to be um, about, what it's, what it, and what is causing it to grow in different directions, instead of being managers. And what we focus on now is the president as a manager. How are we doing on time? Okay, we'll take a break in about 15 minutes or five okay. minutes. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I, 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 let, let me get into um, uh, let me get into how our colleges and universities tend to pick their leaders. I, I remember I was a student at, at Dartmouth, and one night I was walking home quite quite late, maybe one or two o'clock. I looked up at the Northern Lights, which we had over Dartmouth Row. And I looked at my, my school all around me and I, who was responsible for this? You know, and given my kind of background, my primitive background, you know, who really owns this school? You know, who, who runs it? And there was no clear answer for me. And I've tried over the years since then to understand how <laughs> this runs. Who is going to, disrupt or invent or innovate new approaches? Who is going to say, no, we've gone down the wrong road here. Let's choose this road instead and battle it out in order to effectuate his or her ideas. And one of the thoughts that I was struck by way, way back when is that everything about this institution or variety of institutions tends to be, I don't even want to say conservative, is against change. Why? How do you become, who, who runs the place? Well, seems to be the president, or at least he, <clears throat> she is the leader. But how do you get to that position? Well, as you ascend the administrative ladder through various deanships, one of the things you want to be sure not to do is to ruffle any feathers. Because the moment you alienate, members of your faculty, then 
when you're ready for the next step up, people will say, uh uh, not this person. He or she doesn't get along well with people, doesn't unify, and so forth and so forth. So, right there, you have a, um, a, a force which is against the examination of what you're doing in this particular enterprise. And it extends all the way down, not just from the president's office. I mean, deans operate this way because they want to be presidents. Um, the students you know, who are interested in getting good grades, faculty, there's one of these sheets of paper here, uh, a fellow says, um, notice I haven't referred to him for a while. Um, one of them says, yeah, I'm a hypocrite. I admit that, but, but the society runs on hypocrisy. I give my students better grades than they deserve. Yes, and I give them more glowing recommendations than they deserve. Why? So that they will like me and write good evaluations. So I, he admits this, but I saw, I've seen this happen over and over and over again, not on a sheet of paper, but in terms of my colleagues, myself, my friends. I have a wide acquaintance, a, a, a network of friends in various kinds of schools. This, this is the way people think. You don't dare give low grades because then students get back at you. And then that affects your, your evaluation. Yeah. Once again, you see this orientation towards pleasing the customer. That should not be your, your first concern. How can you deal with intellectual matters honestly and with honor when you're putting your own interests first and playing the hypocrite? Um, I remember, and, 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 and you're doing the same thing with students. Um, I remember towards the end of my stay at Union, uh, a young man came to my office and he was huffing and puffing. And I thought it was because of the books he was carrying, uh, lot notebooks. But that wasn't it at all. He was just angry. And he said, you gave me a C in this course. And I said, yeah, I, I don't remember because I always graded my the exams anonymously. I turned the first page over, the title page over. I said, but uh, I, so I don't remember your exam. I said, can I see it? I looked at it and uh, immediately I remembered the exam. And I said, yes, you're absolutely right. I said, I probably should have failed you. <laughs> but but I, I do know, you know, I'm not, I said, I, I can't subject everyone to my ideas and standards when everybody else is operating in a different way. So yes, you did your homework. He said, everything, could you interrupt me? He said, everything in that exam booklet you said in class. And I said, yes, that's why I should have failed you. <laughs> and he looked at me. I said, look, I spend a lot of time designing questions for these examinations. I want you to use what I've said in the classroom, whether you want to agree with me or disagree with me, but also what you talked about with your roommate, uh, your own reading, your own thoughts. I want to see your mind at work on this subject. I'm not testing your memory. And he looked at me and said, oh, <laughs> you want us to think. <laughs> and I remember looking at comic strips, you know, where someone has a light bulb going. <laughs> and I go, yeah, and I said, yes. And his response was, that's not fair. <laughs> and I was astonished. He said, going on, no one has ever asked me to think from grammar school on. And I stopped and thought about it and I said, you know, he's right. And it's something that you have to guard against as a teacher. What do you do? How do you, how do you insist that somebody at least develop ways and methods of thinking when everything around you goes against it? Uh, also towards the end of my career uh, uh, at, uh, uh, at Union, I was wondering, you know, we had great inflation. And then the, the dean would say, provost said, now we've at the start of the year, we've got to guard against great inflation. And then of course he never did a single thing which reinforced that, that, uh, that argument and idea. In fact, it went completely the opposite way. Uh, 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 on, this, on this matter of, of, uh, of great inflation. So I was wondering, you know, what are we doing here? We carry out a student's 
store, um, what is it called? The um, grade point? Grade point average. Would you graduate with a oh. something point average? Yeah. Grade point. Yeah. Grade point yeah. To the second decimal place. Um, what, is, what are we averaging? And so I sent out a questionnaire to a member of the faculty. What determines your grade? What are you grading? Are you grading this particular student against the rest of the students in the class? Against your idea of what a college student should know or, or be able to do? Uh, what, what does this grade mean? And I got a, an amazing batch of replies in which people were honest. <laughs> and yeah, really, I was stunned by the, the candor. And so people in the arts departments said, well, we give out a lot of A's because they, the departments that, that gave out the highest grades were biology, arts, and language, foreign languages. And I was curious as to why. And so uh, the, the responses interested me. Biology said, well, if you don't give out good grades, high grades, the med schools will not take our students. So we inflate the grades. That's why there was a preponderance of A's in their courses. But what about the arts and what about modern languages? Well, they said, if we don't give out good grades, students won't take our courses. And so this is our way of getting people to come to our courses or enrollments hold up. So our, the size of our departments is not shrink. Wow. Well, you'd think that I thought this was a fascinating result to uh, I thought everybody should know about it. Oh, you know, what are we up to? My department chairman at the time called me in and he was angry at me. How dare you? you, know, you the department did not authorize you to send out this questionnaire, this survey. I said, why did I have to go to the department? I didn't send it out as a member of the department. I sent it out under my name. Well, you didn't like that. You still shouldn't do it. You're, you're being a traitor to our team. Well, I didn't feel I was a member of that team. I've been excluded for years. <laughs> In fact, uh, you know, I stepped down from the chairmanship over a matter of principle. I'm very good at resigning over principle, which is probably why I haven't had very much influence. Um, you know, I mean, the notion that I should question this. No, you play the game. Uh, there's... A, in one of these uh, talks here, one of these uh, articles, uh, um, somebody who's disgusted with, with his career, um, he, he talks about the pressure that he feels to keep the, keep the Ponzi going. <laughs> you know, the reference to Ponzi. Mr. Ponzi, where you keep, you know, you keep putting in more and more money to get these high returns. And of course, you're not being paid those returns on the basis of whatever these investments are supposed to be doing, but on the basis of new money that's coming in. And so anyway, on and on and on. That may seem like an outrageous charge to level against any faculty member anywhere. But one of my best friends in life, a guy who became a professor at a, a university, large and well-known university in the Middle West, who was, and he was a professor of medieval and old English. And uh, he was told by his department chairman, we're not, you're not getting enough students for your graduate courses. And he replied, well, there are not enough people going on in, in this field, in my field at the graduate level to, uh, to justify they're going, you know, getting PhDs if they're looking to get jobs. He said, I have friends at Harvard who can't get jobs because, uh, because there's no interest in, at the undergraduate level of taking those courses. And so his department chairman said, well, if you're not going to promote the graduate program at this school, which was inferior to the Ivies in terms of public perception, and that's what really matters. And we won't need you. And so he was fired. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, that is not an isolated case. <clears throat> You've got to keep your enrollments up, no matter what. 
And, and if, if it means that uh, you're going to offer a course in the English department on how to play video games or the meaning of video games or whatever, that's what you do. Uh, do I, I know I'm not supposed to. Oh, I was just going to suggest we take a five minute break. We've got a number of questions. Oh, okay. Uh, but so nature, may, an nature may call. And... Uh, fascinating. I hope some of them attack me. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, don't worry. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Yes. All right. That's very good. Uh, um, let's take a five minute break. Uh, I'm not clear as to the difference between a college and university. You said that the college came first and was more focused in its religious leadership. Is a university a collection of smaller colleges in a single school, each with its own focus? How would you define it? Yes, that's a, that's a, I, sh I should have made that distinction quite clear. Yes, at the beginning. Um, a college, in the sense in which I've been using the word, is at least centrally, an undergraduate institution. And the interests of the undergraduates and the, what you want to be an undergraduate education come first. Whereas the university is just exactly the opposite. It is parasitic on the college in many ways, including financially, um, uh, because what you've developed is a symbiotic system where one reason that you have a university is you have graduate students who can work for cheap. And so it's, you have a kind of not exactly slave labor, but almost. <laughs> um, and, and so that you, know, you keep the, the thing going. Uh, that's really you know, very, very unfortunate. Uh, uh, twice I asked the provost at Dartmouth, can I mention Dartmouth by name? Um, <laughs> and um, I mean, I'm not being facetious. I don't know. I'm, I'm not here to attack Dartmouth. Please understand <laughs> that. What happens at Dartmouth is <laughs> like, it's what's happening everywhere in one way or another. What's happening at Union is happening everywhere. That's the, the, the terrifying part of the whole thing. Um, so, um, um, oh, where was I? Um, Using an example from Dartmouth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, right. I'm graduate students. So I asked this one. Uh, one provost, provost who was uh, the brother of uh, a good friend, very, very uh, fine person in any way, in every way, as far as I knew. I said, what percentage of the instruction at Dartmouth is carried on by non-tenure track faculty, is carried on by non-regular you know, regular faculty who become part of the club and so forth? And he said, over 20%. Uh, I th thought that was rather large, uh, but that's you know, the problem. There is, is you're looking to see people paying these enormous tuition fees for getting instruction from people who would be very happy to leave and get a job at some community college somewhere. I'm not putting down the community college per se, but in terms of you know what defines quality in a college is not paramount in the way they, they set up this organizational structure. Uh, I, I, I had reason why I thought, I, should, should I check this? When his successor came on board as a, as a provost. And so I asked her this question uh, in an auditorium and she said, I don't know, which was significant. And then I said, well, I, by your predecessor has been told that it's, it's at least 20%. And she said, oh yes, certainly that. Um, and it's interesting, she went on to become, to become chancellor at the University of North Carolina. And she came from a school that was a university. So her mindset, the way in which she thought of problems, the way she addressed, all that was university-like. And in fact, I love to mention her name, Carol Folt, I have nothing against her personally, I don't know her personally, um, was one of the leaders, was one of the leaders of the movement, which had a lot of resistance, to rename Dartmouth, Dartmouth University. <laughs> uh, and now it's sort of in the limbo, and sometimes it's, a, it's gotten to the point where they dare you say Dartmouth University, and they don't expect a great backlash. I remember when um, uh, Friedman was named president of Dartmouth, and he was interviewed on national radio and 
and he referred to it as Dartmouth University and alumni all over the place were up in arms because nobody did anything about it. But they're very sensitive to this. Why? Because it involves money coming in. And money calls the tune. Let's face it, uh, so much of what colleges and universities do is dictated by money. You know, and when they, one, of the, one of the ways you rise in the system is by being a good fundraiser. <laughs> and being a good fundraiser does not mean I want money for this. You know, you don't say that. You use these broad terms that make you feel positive. So it's a capital drive, not a capital drive, but one of the drives at Dartmouth called Move Dartmouth. Move Dartmouth where? And why? That question was never addressed, right? And now we have the, the Capital Gifts campaign. It's called Call to Lead, which I first read as Call to Lead. Um, show me one. Um, you know, Lead where? Lead why? Now to come back to the question. Yes, now Dartmouth has an institute of energy. I mean, all this money, these billions of dollars come in, you as an administrator, as one of the people who run this show, right, to show that you are on top of things, that you have produced results so that when they have a history of this institution, they'll say, look at this guy, he's built these buildings. He has instituted these programs. The foremost question in his or her mind is not, why do we need that? How is that going to affect the overall pattern of instruction and so forth? That never comes up. And so you have this proliferation of, yes, colleges, quote unquote, organizations, faculties devoted to single pursuits. And very often, uh, these are related to the research interests of the person who's giving the money or the corporation who's giving the money or who is doing the job that is assigned to it by the federal government, which is the chief source of money for these places. So the federal government is calling the shots in, in private education. We really don't have private education anymore. We have private colleges in name, but strongly, strongly, it's like being an Eastern, Eastern European state that, that, that Putin wants, you know? You may have the facade of being independent, but you, you, know, you march to the tune that is called by, the Soviet, by, by Russia. That's not a healthy situation. I'm sorry. No, I'm just gonna, uh, there's a, a comment from uh, somebody who responded anonymously. Uh, they, <laughs> uh, said that they gra graduated from the University of Rochester in 1962, with a, uh, in 63 with a master of ed, MA in English uh, from Brown in 72. Uh, took courses at Purdue in Indiana while her husband uh, worked on a PhD. Uh, she said, I'm also attend I also attended the private girls' uh, primary and secondary schools. And I learned to read uh, the first day of uh, first grade. I never encountered the restraint or inhibitions of my learning that Professor Gato describes, or Gato. So <laughs> instead, I was encouraged to study and write about whatever my interest happened to be. So I just, there was a, a differing point of view. So I a different, can I comment on Sure. That? She went to a private school didn't she? Uh, I went to so. a public school system where the primary concern was the football team. We had to win the state championship. Who taught me history? The, coach? the football coaches. <laughs> they didn't know crap about history. <laughs> I was astonished. In, in course after course, the coaches taught English and history because Everybody can do that. Right. And it's nonsense. Um, and, and no energy was, I mean, my sister went through the same thing in the school system. Uh, you know, I, I congratulate you, but you are, this woman from Rochester is hardly typical. The, you know, I mean, I, I, I had one wonderful teacher, Sally Flammenbaum. Uh, uh, she was just superb. She, she gave me her library card. She said, you, know, you take out books. She recognized that I had interests beyond these crappy books that I was taught in English, you know, that I had to, to it's just awful what's happened. We, we don't approach the teaching of literature in the right way, according to me. And I don't know if you want me to go into that or not, but I probably not. Okay. Well, I will, there's two questions that are very similar. One from Tom Hodgson, 
Are there any institutions of higher education that approximate the educational ideal you have in mind? And another one uh, from an anonymous uh, contributor saying, does Professor Gatto know of any schools which do encourage students' preferences and promote innovative learning today? No. <laughs> Sorry, and I'm not being answer. captious because everything in this huge sprawling structure is, is against those forces which make for innovation, which make which put education first. Okay, uh, I don't know if we have time for you know very very. I'll try to make it as quick as possible. I taught at the University of Uppsala in Sweden, um, and you, you get a sense of how these massive structure universities work. Okay. The government had decided that their system for grading, and you didn't get graded in individual courses, you took exams and that gave you points, okay? Um, and um, the system by which, by which students in the various departments uh, were, uh, you know, got their certificates um, were looked upon as being too expensive because the exams went through three levels. Uh, and, uh, and at each level, more students were given their points, okay? And they decided that this was, was expensive and not very, so they appointed a royal commission. In Sweden, everything is royal commission, and therefore they speak the truth. And when I heard about what was going on, I went in and I spoke to the minister of education. And he said, well, look, we have studied this. We sent a, you know, not for two weeks or two months or two years, two decades, two decades. And we got, with this new system, which is the multiple choice exam. Okay. <laughs> and I explained why this was bad and he wasn't listening. All right, fine. One night, a, a, a former a Don at, uh, at Oxford called me up who detested the United States. This was during the Vietnam War. Uh, and, and thought we were a backward country. And, so, and, and, and of course I was the exception in his eyes, but otherwise <laughs> America was lost. And this was late at night and he called me up and he asked me a number of questions. In America, do they say, you know, in America? And finally, I said, David, you know, we do speak and write the same language with minor variations, you know? And he said, well, that, I said, why are you asking me these questions? He said, well, that does it. There's a multiple choice examination. And this was the new system, which was getting much cheaper and much fairer, right? The new system, the multiple choice examination, I don't know, 150 questions, whatever it was. And David said, for not every question, uh, the, the instructions at the top said, to every question, there is one and only one correct answer. And he said, and after our conversation, I'm convinced that American usage of the English language is not the exception, that we do have the same general rules and so forth. And he said, and for not one question, not one on that examination, is there one and only one correct answer. In some, there are no correct answers, and some there are two, and some there are three, et cetera. I said, this is terrible, David. This is on the basis, of, basis on which people are going to be qualified. He said, I said, I'm going to do nothing. He asked me, why? He said, it's their country. <laughs> well, what do I do in conscience? So I spoke to the leader of the student union, which is like a labor union. It's not like our student unions. And I didn't like this guy because he didn't want anybody taking any, I didn't, he didn't want any book taught that was published before 1900. So that told you right away because it wasn't relevant. Anyway, do I talk to this guy or not? And finally, I sit down and talk to him. I explain what happened or what the exam was like. And he said, I don't understand. What's the problem? I said, well, maybe I didn't explain it correctly. I went over it again. And he said, well, everybody had the same chance. Oh, my God. So then I, I talked to the hair doctor professor in charge of the department. Nice guy. He had me go into his office. I said I wanted to talk to him. And I explained the nature of the exam and the problem with it. And he said, oh, this is terrible. I think at last there's somebody who's sane. He said, I hope no one finds out about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that was Sweden. Yeah. But the same kind of mentality goes on mm. at our, you know, during the Vietnam War. The wheels came off the cart. We used to have major field examinations at the end where we talked to students and basic questions about to make sure that they had some grasp of why they had read what they had read and so forth. And we had this encounter where everybody would fail, no matter how simple the question. And so the answer was, get rid of the major field examination. Mm. Um, 
Did we try to readdress what our curriculum? No, of course not. We had to have students. We had to have courses. And that's the primary consideration. I know I sound like some crazy, but believe me, this is the daily life that I kept encountering. And so finally, various problems. In 1995, I, I left out of terminal disgust. I just couldn't go on anymore. I, first of all, I was getting all these, you know, all these knives in the back. So I was going to class, one feeling that I had to defend myself against these outrageous and untrue charges that would be letters against well, my colleagues in the department. And, 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 and you get to the point you say, I can't go on with this anymore. Yes. Let me, uh, the two questions from Randy Ringer. Uh, one is if colleges want to serve the interests of their customers, what is the value of requiring students to take a core curriculum rather than allowing them to take courses that the student is interested in pursuing? Uh, that's exactly what's happening. The core curriculum is, uh, is evaporating. That concept is evaporating over and over again. I think he's asking what's wrong with allowing that. Oh, uh, I think there's nothing wrong with allowing it, but, but a certain concept uh, that first of all, I mean, when when someone goes when someone goes to a doctor, let's say for advice, mm -hmm. it's it should it be the, the patient who who uh, determines the prescription or the person who supposedly knows more about what this fellow person needs. I'm not saying that core curricula should not constantly be examined. I'm not saying that the core curricula uh, have served all that well. Uh, one of the things I noted at, at Union was that every time there was a curricular reform, it had a certain lifespan, and it was seven years. Uh, someone would, first of all, it was these discussions, and I was in on a lot of them. First of all, the people who were appointed to the committee uh, were, were there because they, they served different constituencies. So if you're going to study the curriculum, you have to have a person from engineering, you have to have a, you know, these things. And now all these people have, it's like Congress, they have to bring home the bacon for their people. You know, anything that's, if you propose a reform that drops a particular requirement, that's gonna mean lower enrollments in some division. No, no, he, that, that guy can't go back and tell his constituents that, that he approved this sort of thing. So first of all, the same people kept getting appointed to committees. They would propose something which seemed like a radical departure, and they, in many cases, they were except in terms of who serves, who, who the personnel are in these courses, right? And then this crazy idea, which is usually, it, it would quickly start developing cracks. And say, oh, well, give it a chance to work out. Well, over the course of seven years, things could get worse and worse and worse, and that whole thing had to collapse. And so now they had to appoint a new committee to study the question all over again. And it was never what I would regard as the kind of investigation and the kind of discussion that this kind of, of committee should have. Again, because of the politics involved. I'm gonna ask you another question from Randy, uh, or a comment, question, yeah, it's a question. Uh, my daughter just graduated from college 50 years after I did. In our conversations, it struck me that the way that her courses were being taught were incredibly similar to how I, how the courses I took 50 years earlier had been taught. When I see all of the changes and progress that's been made in other parts of our society, why hasn't higher education changed all that much? Well, I think I've, I've spoken to that. It's because essentially change that comes about or that is proposed in terms of a disruption of the system or the approach or the, the goals um, is seen as a threat. And so no matter whether one is a Marxist or a, you know, a, a, a conservative, what comes first is my job, my future, um, my department. And so you, you know, you have these defensive postures. You know, it's, it's, it's alarming what, what goes on. Yeah. I'm going to read you a uh, question and a comment from Mary Grizard, who's also a college professor. Uh, she said, he uses his hands beautifully when he speaks. What do what? 
You use your hands beautifully when you speak. I'm Italian. Piemontese heritage, perhaps, but it's wonderful to see. Does she know me? No, she's looking at you. Oh, oh. <laughs> Based yes. on some of his comments, yes. about, the, Based on some some of his comments about the interdepartmental strife, it reminds me of Richard Russo's book, Straight Man, yes. in which there is yes. a hilarious scene of a professor taking refuge in the ceiling above the room where, where a faculty meeting is taking place. He was spying on the ongoings. <laughs> on a more serious note, what is Professor Gatto's view of access to college education on the part of potential rural students, for instance, who have no tradition of higher education in their families, access would include finances as well as adaption to a different culture. Yeah, it's not it's not sufficiently uh, taken into account. I agree with the implication behind the question. Yeah, um, and, you know, this matter of, of recruiting students or getting students. Um, I think it was a very important one. Um, I sat down with members of the college admissions department and I said, I read this stuff that you're going to praise this, the uniqueness of the, of the union education. I said, have you ever sat in a union college classroom? No. Have you ever talked to a professor about what he or she? No. And yet you, you know, you publish this stuff as always somehow. You know, by saying something, it's true. Uh, look, if colleges spend half the money on, 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 on recruiting the best, in terms of what they can do for that student, the best students, recruiting the best faculty, reviewing the best faculty, right? That they spend on recruiting athletes. <laughs> can you imagine, and coaches, can you imagine the kind of improvement that could be made, but these questions are never raised. The admissions departments don't talk to the students. Frank, I'm gonna the have to the questions don't. are pouring in, so I need to move. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, no, I'm just trying to get, to okay. get rid of this guy. Get rid of yes. Should the current higher education sector be judged by its contribution to alleviating or worsening social and economic inequality? No, not, not in those terms. I mean, I, should it address him? It should raise the question. It raises the question. Should it be terms, judged by its contribution? I'm sorry? Should it be judged by its contribution? No, because that, that assumes a certain outcome. You know, that assumes a certain, you know, I think there should be a discussion. I think there should be debates. I think there should be, what should come, happen in a college is a, 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 a beating together of different opinions. But that's again exactly what what everything in the structure, not only what goes in the classroom, but the, the whole corporate enterprise re refuses to do. When when Phil Hanlon became president nine years ago, and I have that quotation here somewhere, he said, we should encourage dissent. When dissent occurs, we should not throttle it, we should, but we should give that person a microphone. Well, I have not been. Uh, anonymous, uh, but I have not received in either UPS or Federal Express or the, you know, United, or the United States Postal System a microphone. Quite the contrary, they have fought. They have fought to keep these discussions from occurring. I have tried to uh, to, to discuss with my classmates in class meetings. Oh no, we can't talk about that. It would hurt. It would hurt the fund drives. And and alumni oh, aren't interested in that. I, uh, and, and at the end of uh, about 2007, so I got involved in the alumni movement at, at Dartmouth. Alumni had a contractual obligation, not a right, an obligation to oversee what was going on in the college. We were immediately charged with being crazy right wingers, with being, you know, uh, uh, wing nut religious Nothing was too scurrilous for them not to throw at us. And we were preventing, prevented from this was, and it was a crucial time because it was during this period that this particular institution, and this was going on at other institutions as well, was trying to decide whether it wanted to be a college or a university. Not once was this question ever addressed. Not once was it ever addressed openly. Who made this decision? Will faculty make this decision? No, it was made by trustees and presidents. 
And they, it's, it's served their interest. You know, I, I had lunch with an, an outgoing trustee. I don't know if he would have been chairman of the, I thought he was chairman of the board. Maybe he wasn't at the end. And he looked at me and after I was talking about various, various problems and said, what's the difference in the classroom between a college and university? I was astounded. He had never looked at that question, never. I mean, I was floored. And the huge different difference in terms of what you teach and why you teach it, huge. And then the implications for how instruction is carried out. I've touched on a few of these matters now. Uh, yeah. Frank, a question we have is, what about the great books program at St. John's? Um, <laughs> well, it's better than, than you know, a, a curriculum which is relevant, you know, relevant. Everything has to be relevant. Um, and what determines relevance is, you know, what's going on last week somewhere. And I think that the purpose of, one of the purposes of education is to give you a step back, to understand that certain problems are deep-seated, uh, exist in the past, different ways of looking at fundamental questions, is to remove the student from the cocoon of the present in which he or she has grown up, right? If the purpose is to, is to confront the student with different ideas, not to just you know, <laughs> swallow everything that's, that comes down the pipe because it's happening today. To see that what we're talking about today has a long history. And it should not, this discussion should not have a predetermined result. As long as someone observes the rules, rationality, civility, evidence, the need for evidence, we've lost all that. We just shout at each other. And that's wrong, whether it happens in the, in the classroom or on the political platform, it, 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 it injures society. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. Uh, Amy Flockton raised, um, raised the point that Swarthmore did not calculate GPA for these reasons in, yep. in your comment about the great point average. Right. Uh, made applying to grad schools tough, but a point of personal pride for us being the alums. Yes, but Swarthmore also had, had a reputation. <laughs> as uh, you know, uh, uh, making a true academic achievement, I don't know to what degree they succeeded, but that was their reputation paramount. So you know, they, they, they created a reputation for excellence. So I don't know that Swarthmore students were hurt that much by it, but if you're going to have great point averages, make them mean something. And in so many ways, make them mean something. Here's an interesting question. Uh, it says, I'm a Dartmouth graduate, who majored in classics. Mm, wonderful. However, however, I took several math courses, including four upper level math courses. I wonder how you feel about classes like physics for poets that are designed to give liberal art and social science majors easy science credits awesome. that are, that are I assume, needed for graduation. Reprehensible. I believe that if a student is smart enough to matriculate at Dartmouth, you should need to take a real science math course. Yeah, well, that's the game they play. I mean, I, I had to take four. I had to take four, four courses in the sciences, so that was part of the core curriculum. Um, uh, not well, my geology course, I get, which I took out of genuine interest, um, was immediately oh, a terrible course. I remember the professor said, held up as the example of of how we miscalculate or misunderstand things, and he attacked it the tectonic plate theory, which had just come out there. Mm -hmm. This is a lot of craziness, you know, just because the outlines sort of fit and, uh, and a lot of other reasons why the course was not worth very much. But I think that's the only course that I took that at least tried to be within the methodology of the discipline. So what, what happened? You, know, you set up this thing, everybody gets to have usually a weak member of the department, teach, usually, to teach the course. Um, and uh, so you, you, know, you, you keep the enrollments um, up and, and why you have that requirement is lost. Um, you know, physics for poets, come on. Uh, you know, uh, well, I won't use that example. I've, Go I've got about three, I think we have time for three more questions. Oh dear. If we answer them briefly. Uh, I'm saving one for last because it'll just send you to the roof. Um, Bob, Bob Jakubik uh, writes that there's a public opinion survey designed by a Harvard sociologist that's been, con that's been conducted since 1954. 
It asks a simple question. Do you, do you or don't you feel as free to speak your mind as you used to? Huh. In 1954, 13% said they didn't. Today, it's 48%. Uh, is, meaning, is meaningful college education possible with that level of self-censorship? Yeah, no, and it's much, much worse than that question indicates. Much worse. I'm in communication with a lot of people all across the country. People who are retiring from very good schools, including Harvard, saying, God, I'm glad to be out of the classroom. A, 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 a fellow wrote an article for, uh, from B BU, taught literature for 40 years. A student challenged him, uh, saying, that how dare he, as a male, teach Madame Bovary. Uh, he was uh, called upon to take an examination, to, take a, a que uh, to answer a questionnaire. <coughs> Uh, to decide whether he was uh, you know, anti-female. or He's smart enough to know what the right answers are, even when he doesn't agree. This is terrible. Mm -hmm. This is shocking. It is absolutely repugnant. But it's going on all over the place. I mean, I, have, I don't have time. But, <laughs> but, you know, people are leaving this profession in droves. There's the degree of disgust, of exhaustion, mm -hmm. of, of cynicism. It's, it's going, look, to, today, a bridge collapsed in Pittsburgh. That's the nature of our infrastructure today because of all this crap that's been going on. This political football has been going on for 20 years. Our intellectual infrastructure is in just as bad shape and nobody's talking about it. We're not addressing that problem at all. We have a question uh, from Lou Phillips, Louis Phillips, who signs this signs out as a concerned grandparent in California. Yeah. Today, be. Yeah. today, where is a student to be introduced, among other ideas, to the tensions between individuals and their institutions, between thought and experience, between real and ideal? No one. <laughs> no. He, I, I, if he's concerned, he's absolutely right. Sorry, Lewis. Absolutely right. <laughs> um, uh, I've got uh, well, one from Scott Serpens. Uh, Frank, have you read Richard Detweiler's new book published by MIT Press, the, the Evidence Liberal Arts Needs Lives of Consequence, Inquiry, and Accomplishment? Uh, the, book, the book captures the opinions of a thousand people ages 25 through 65, looks at purpose, content, and context. Uh, it is the third category, context, that makes all the difference. The book argues that the idea that it matters, not the discipline, not, is that the idea, it is the idea that matters, not the discipline. Humanity, social science, or science, it matters to go deep and take more than half of your courses outside of your discipline. Connect with faculty in and out, connect with faculty in and outside of the classroom. Yeah, I, I don't know if I follow up. The answer, quick answer to the, the, the basic question is no, I haven't read it. Um, I've not made this my, uh, my specialty, as you know, I'm trying before I die, which is going to happen fairly soon. Um, no, that's not a joke. I mean, I am racing against the clock. Uh, our greatest, our greatest work of literature, Moby Dick, is basically completely misunderstood. Uh, and, and, and the academia has a lot of blame in that matter. And I want to set the record straight, at least in terms of my ideas, what I'm convinced is, is true about that book and its importance and what Melville is, is dealing with. And so I'm, I'm focusing, to the extent to which I focus on anything, I'm focusing on that. So I, and it's also so depressing, you know, these people who want to save the humanities. How do they want to save the humanities? We'll have to show how physics and other sciences and math are relevant to it or it's relevant to them. That's not what we're talking about. Let's talk about what makes for basic relevance in these and what the, the motivating spirit is in these disciplines themselves before we worry about how it's related to something that's very, very different. Um, All right, and I will now read you the last question. And it's the last not, question. Last question, and it says at the end of it, it says any comment, and I'd like you to restrict yourself to one word. Oh, <laughs> That's easy. Dartmouth has an $8 billion endowment. Yes. Some critics refer to such elite institutions with vast endowment wealth as hedge funds with libraries. Yes. Any comment? That's, one word. It sounds like Jim Kenyon. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. It was anonymous. Oh, well, I've <laughs> I, I Kenyon's... Uh, 
I, I got that phrase from Kenyon. Oh, okay. And he's right. Who's calling the shots? Mm -hmm. People who manage hedge funds, people who have billions of dollars. They're the people, that they're trustees who matter and they're trustees who are there as window dressing. The people who call the shots everywhere in the country are the people with the billions of dollars who are looked to build the next building uh, on <clears> campus. <throat> it's money that's called the tune. Until we put education first in our, on our agenda, this crap is going to continue and we're not addressing it. Hanlon is now, has now announced his resignation. I wonder the, the kinds of questions that the candidates for his post will be asked. I have never been at one of those sessions, and I've been in a lot of them, where the, the sophistication of the questions matches the demands of the job. Not one. That is shocking. Trustees don't know what they're supposed to be looking at. I mean, at Union, back when you were a student, we had a wonderful member of the board. He was unique and then he would come three days early for the meetings and he would talk to students and he would talk to faculty and he got an idea of what was going on. He was the exception. Another member of the board flew in on his private plane and when he sits, and sits down at the table, someone says, um, your term expired last year. That's how that's how much aware they were of what's going on. It doesn't, doesn't happen. And somebody should be addressing these questions. So it's not just drifting into a direction like, like Topsy, just growing for the sake of growing. Is that the last question? That was the last question. Oh dear, well, it's been interesting. I'm, I'm sure everybody feels much better about the state of higher education. <laughs> well, if but I, I do, I really I'm, want to thank you. I'm sorry if I have repeated myself. There are all sorts of things that I wanted to get into um, that I haven't. But then, as I started to say at the beginning, every time I'm passionate about something, these are not easy. These are not simple questions. These are not simple <laughs> issues. But we really have to try to provide a means by which we can talk about them. We and did have one last should, comment. And we should be, we should not be shutting out not just alumni with money, but alumni who are interested in these questions, which was one of the great advantages that Dartmouth had uh, at, at the drill of 1891, where alumni were, and the Alumni Association and the Alumni Council were set up not to tell people what to do, but to see as overseers, what were, to get information before the trustees and also get from the trustees and a discussion of what their intentions were. Well, I so. will I will end this session with one last comment that just snuck in. Yeah. Uh, his name is Steve uh, Malikian. And I'm wondering if he's a relative of yours because no. he said, this session has been great. I wish all Dartmouth alumni, alumni and alumni could view it. Well, apparently it's it, will on, it will be on YouTube. <laughs> it will be on YouTube. Uh, yes. And uh, you, you know, look it up under my name, G A D O, no T in there. Okay. Uh, just get to <laughs> YouTube, and you, you know, you'll find all kinds of stuff there. I've never given a good lecture on YouTube, but at least you can get some of my. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you so much, Frank, for your energy and your enthusiasm and your lecture today. We had seventy-four people in attendance, and. We could really go on to the, the questions and the answers were terrific. Um, and people who signed up, thank you for supporting OSHA's special events. This has been great. Mm -hmm.